day. I preached a revival here when Curtis Guest was pastor. Uh, that was before you were even born. And I think the last time I supplied here was probably in 96, and a few of you were children at that time, I reckon. I appreciate the opportunity of being here in your beautiful sanctuary and with you as we worship the Lord together. The scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'll give you a moment to look that up. Let the church be the church is the title of the message. Let the church be the church. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 9. If you're able and if you choose to, you may stand now while we read the scripture. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God who giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. You may be seated. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place, place made holy because of your presence. We thank you for the privilege of being with a praying people with a praising people. We pray for our interim pastor while he's away from us. We pray for healing for him and for a good time and safe passage back with us. We pray for our nominating committee and our pastor search committee as they seek those to fill those positions under your leadership. We ask Heavenly Father as we study together now your word that uh, we'd be aware of your Holy Spirit's presence and direction in our lives. We pray that he would speak those things to us that maybe uh, the minister does not speak. And we pray, Father, that if there are those here who are not saved, that they'd come to know Jesus in a personal way as Savior and Lord. And we pray that those who search for a church home would find uh, your leadership in being a part of this great congregation. Thank you for your love and grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I'm sure you have some great concerns as I do about our nation. I'm privileged to have been born in America and to grow up in America. Uh, we have been and are a great nation. Uh, but you see, as I do, that we do not... Uh, claim to be the strong nation under God that we used to be. Many people have fallen away. In some areas, even in our own nation, Christianity is being denigrated, and we Christians are going to have to take a real stand. The church is not this building. It's a church building. You are the church. Today, we are the church gathered. Tomorrow, we'll still be the church, but we'll be the church scattered all over the place. Whatever we're doing, wherever we are, we'll be mindful of the fact that we are the church of the living Lord Jesus Christ. In our churches, we must be very careful that we become, if we're not already, all that God wants us to be. So 
I say to us this morning, let the church be the church in harmony. If there are any people in the world who ought to be able to get along with each other, it's the church. We don't need schisms and divisions. We don't need hatred in the church. There's enough of that outside. We who've been redeemed by the blood of Christ know that he loved us and he forgave us. And since he loved us and forgave us, we can and we must love and forgive each other. I would think from what I heard before the service started this morning when you were fellowshipping together that you must have good harmony. I'm grateful for that. For you see, when the church has disharmony, the people in the community know about that. And if they're not Christians, and if they're not a part of the church, then they say, yeah, look at those people. They claim to be this and they claim to be that. Look what they're doing. Listen to what's going on there. It's imperative that we have harmony in our churches. It was a family like the Waltons that you see on television, but it was not the Walton family. It was back during that uh, age and that period. They all lived in a big house, and uh, when members of the family would be married, they'd all move into the big house, and they'd have a room here or a room there. And the older boy, wasn't John boy, but the older boy got married, and soon after he married, when everybody was together in the great room and they were having good fellowship together, he came in, he had been to town and bought him a new pair of breeches. Now I know we don't call them breeches anymore. We call them trousers and slacks, but in those days they were breeches. And he announced to his relatively new bride, I need you to cut two inches off of my new breeches. She huffed up, and in no uncertain terms, she let him know, I don't do britches. All of a sudden, that room became cold, and people were looking at each other. They, they were not used to that sort of thing. One by one, they began to get up and slip out and go to their rooms. He went to his room with his bride, and hung his britches on the bedpost, and everybody went to sleep. Sometime during the night, the old grandmother, who'd not gone to sleep, got to thinking, you know, we've never had this kind of thing in our family. We've never had this kind of disharmony. And so she slipped up and went in there and got those trousers, those britches off of the bedpost, and went in another room and by an oil lamp she cut up two inches off and stitched them back up, slipped back in there and put them on the bedpost again, went back and went to bed. Sometime later, the mother got to thinking. <laughs> you know, we've never had this kind of disharmony in our house. And she got up and went in there and got those trousers and went into her room and about oil lamp. She cut off two inches and stitched them back, went back in there, went back to her room. Just before daylight, that new bride got to thinking. You know, I said something in a harsh way that I shouldn't have said, and I could tell the whole family was affected by that. I'm going to make that right. And she got up and went in and got those trousers, slipped them off of the bedpost, went back, cut two inches off, and put them back. Now, I don't know what that old boy thought the next morning when he put his new britches on, and they were six inches shorter than he thought they were going to be. But don't you like the attitude of the grandmother? She wasn't used to disharmony, and she was willing to do what she could do to restore harmony. And don't you like the attitude of the mother who did the same thing? And eventually the bride realized she was wrong and did what needed to be done to help restore the harmony in the church. Folks, we just have to love each other because we've been loved. And there's not anything that's big enough that should divide us and separate us. Now, we're not going to compromise on the Word of God. It's the same. But there are other things that really do not matter. In the light of eternity, in the light of lost souls, in the light of people that need to be brought to Christ, what difference does it make if the piano's here and the organ's there or if, the, or if it's reversed? 
What difference does it make in the light of eternity what color the walls and the carpet is? We don't have to argue and fuss about those things. In the spirit of love, we can be together. Some of the arguments that church folks have are so senseless and certainly so unnecessary. It reminds me of the young couple that got married, and soon after they married, they went and bought them an electric blanket. The problem was they bought one with just one control on it. He put it on two, and she was too cold, and she slipped over and put it on five. And that went back and forth all night. And before daylight, that new couple was saying things to each other harshly that they didn't think they would ever say to each other. Got up early in the morning and looked, and the thing wasn't even plugged in. <laughs> Silly. But some of the things we argue and fuss over in our churches are just as silly and senseless as that. In the light of God's love, let's guard with all of our will and might. Let's guard the harmony of the church. Let the church be the church in harmony. Let the church be the church in faithfulness. The scripture says in Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the custom is, even so in the light of the approaching day. Faithfulness. It's amazing to me the kind of excuses that some people make for staying away from church. I have been visiting in between interims with different churches and visited with the church uh, last Sunday, I think, is when I heard this. The pastor said when he was dealing with the search committee, he asked them, how many people do we have in our Sunday school? And he said, he said, well, we have 500, but they don't all come at the same time. We have 250 one Sunday and 250 the next Sunday, but they're not the same people. Sunday schools are very weak in attendance. I noted in your bulletin, Sunita, my wife, uh, called it to my attention, you still have church training. Many churches don't. WMU has grown weak in many churches. Some churches don't even have a brotherhood of men's meeting anymore. That's where we learned about our missions from our WMU and our brotherhood. We taught our children that growing up. We must be faithful. Now, I'm not talking about not being able to be away sometimes. We, we need to rest. Jesus even had his disciples to rest. He said, come ye apart and rest for a while. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those little silly things that we let keep us from going to church. This is where we hear the word of God. This is where we study together. This is where we share with each other. This is where we learn to grow in our faith and our faithfulness. The old boy was real rough. Didn't have much education that showed in his speech. But he got converted. And he came to really love the Lord with all of his heart. As we sometimes say, he was on fire for the Lord. And he kept going, and, and the pastor said, pestering him. I, I've never known any pastor that was pestered by somebody coming and saying, Preacher, give me something to do. Help me to serve the Lord. And most of us pastors would love to hear that from all of the congregation. But this old boy just did it so much, it sort of became a, 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 a problem to him. One day he came in, and the pastor was behind his desk. And he said, Preacher, give me something to do. The preacher said, all right, I have prepared a list of 10 men who are members of our church, and some of them hadn't been here in a long time, and, and all of them come just intermittently. They're not here very much. I want you to go and contact them and get them back in church. I want you to help them to be faithful. And as we're talking, you notice some of the church stationery there. He said, by the way, here's some church stationery. If you want to write them a letter, then you take this and you write them a letter. A week or two later, the pastor got a letter. And it was from one of those recalcitrant church members. D. 
Dear Pastor, I'm sorry that I've been missing the services. Fine and close my check for $1,000 to make up for my offerings that I haven't been given since I was absent. And I promise you that I'll be there this Sunday, and with God's providence, I'm not going to miss any more Sundays. He signed it and put his name there. And then he put a P.S. He said, P.S., please tell your secretary that there's just one T in dirty and no C in skunk. <laughs> now, we're not going to call people dirty skunks. And we're not going to call them anything that's uh, bad. But we need to have the spirit of that young guy who loved the Lord and loved people and wanted to give them back in church. Be thou faithful unto death, the scripture says, and I'll give you a crown of life. He's been faithful to us. Let's be faithful to him. It is required of stewards that they be faithful, and not just in matters of finance, but we are God's stewards, and we must be faithful. I read on the back of one of our church bulletins, like the ones that you used some time ago, uh, about a missionary in uh, the western part of these United States. He was missionary among the Indians. And on a given Sunday morning, when they were having a worship service like ours, at the end of the invitation, at the end of the service, he gave an invitation and said, if there was anyone who's not living right and wanted to rededicate their lives, recommit themselves to come forward during the invitation. As soon as they started the invitation hymn, a full-blooded Osage Indian was the first one to walk down the aisle. The preacher was surprised because he was so faithful. And so the preacher said to him, the missionary, why have you come down? And the Indian said, I have been a Christian for two years. And I've been a member of this church for two years. And in those two years, I've missed one time, and I want the Lord and I want the congregation to forgive me. Wow. How many times would you have to ask for forgiveness for not being here? Just on a whim. Not any real problem keeping you from coming. You just decided you wouldn't come. Be thou faithful. If we're going to make a difference in our world, they're going to have to see a difference in us. You may be the only life and the only Bible that some folks may see and read. Be faithful, not only in attendance, but in the way you live. Let the church be the church in faithfulness. And then let the church be the church in witnessing. Oh, I can remember when we used to have uh, a week in February. Some of you may remember that, when we had uh, Soul Winning Commitment Week. We'd have a week of training. We would assign uh, uh, names of people in the community to individuals, and they would go out and they'd knock on doors and they'd witness. They tell me now that you can't knock on doors. I think the problem is we're just not doing it. I know that the use of those little old uh, iPhones and, and computers, uh, you can reach a lot more people a lot quicker, but the personal touch is missing in that. And we need, and you may get turned away some, it, it does happen, never has happened to me yet. Knock on that door and say, uh, I'm a member Chunky Baptist Church, and we'd just love for you to come be a part of our fellowship. Cultivate that individual, and as you have opportunity, witness to that person. It just may be that you're the one to lead that person and that family to faith in Jesus Christ. We must be witnessing. It was on a Sunday morning. And he came out of his uh, house uh, into his driveway, 
had on his suit and his tie, had his Bible and his Sunday school book under his arm, and was about to get in his truck when his neighbor came out of his house, had on one of the little flat lid golfing hats, you know, caps, and had his golf clubs over his shoulder and was fixing to get in his car, and he looked over and saw his neighbor and said, Hey, Henry, come go golfing with me today. Henry pulled himself up on his tallest pie stature and said, Why, no, it's Sunday, and I wouldn't go golfing with you. I'd go to church. The golfer very quietly said, Henry, I've often wondered about your church, and I've noticed your faithfulness, your integrity. And you know, this is the seventh time that I've invited you to go golfing with me, and you have never invited me to go to church with you. It may be that somebody's just waiting for you to come by and show a real genuine interest in their soul, in their life. You probably will not recognize the name, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I hadn't learned to speak English yet, much less Japanese, but his name was Mitsuo Fujita. Anybody recognize that name? No, but you will when I tell you who he was. He was the commander who led the Japanese Air Force in the attack on Pearl Harbor. After the war was over, Fujita set about to prove that the Americans had tortured their Japanese prisoners. He had heard that Americans had been very brutal in their torture. And so he set about to find out what he could. He had a friend who had been a prisoner of war in a hospital camp in Utah, America. I didn't know we had any Japanese. I was just a kid in those days, and I didn't know we had Japanese prisoners over here. And he asked him, were you tortured as an American prisoner of war? He said, oh, no, quite the contrary said, that nurse who took care of us and nursed us back to health had parents who were in the Philippines when we attacked the Philippines, and our soldiers brutally murdered her mother and father who were missionaries. But she loved us as a Christian woman, and she ministered to us and dealt with us the best she knew how with the wounds that we had. Well, that helped for Chita to change his mind a little bit, but not much. It just irritated him about the atomic bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Along about that time, somebody put in his hands a, a, a gospel tract about an American bombardier who had been shot down and was a prisoner of the Japanese and was tortured brutally, and he hated his captors with all of his being, did everything he could to upset the routines. And one day, one of those Japanese soldiers who was guarding him gave him a copy of God's Word, and he began to read it. What else can you do when you're in prison? He read that book over and over, became a Christian completely changed his attitude about his captors, and he began to love them where he had hated them. When Fujita read that, that made an impression on him too, but he still was not satisfied. And someone else put in his hands a copy of God's Word in his language, in the Japanese language. He read it. And he came to that scripture in Luke uh, 23, 34, where Jesus was hanging on the cross, dying for the sins of men like me and you. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for 
because they know not what they do. And the Holy Spirit used that to touch his heart. And he said in that moment, Christ came into his life. And he was changed from a Japanese military officer to a warrior for Jesus Christ. He gave up his opportunity to be the commander-in-chief of the Japanese Air Force so he could be a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that's a long story and it's an interesting story, but the reason I told you that story is, is this. What if that nurse had not been the Christian lady that she was? What if somebody had not written that track about that American sergeant who was shot down and was converted? And what if somebody had not taken that track and given it to that Japanese commander? And what if somebody had not translated the word of God into the language that he could read and understand? You see, this was the witness that God was using to bring him to a faith in Jesus Christ. What our world needs today is for the church to be the church and witnessing, reaching out into our communities across this land and, and even across the world to tell the world God loves you, and he'll make a difference in your life if you'll just commit yourself, surrender yourself to him. So my plea this morning is let the church, you, us, let the church be the church in harmony, in faithfulness, and in witnessing to the power of God to make a difference in the human life. Bow with me again for a moment. How are things between you and God? Honestly now, how are things between you and God? Are you saved? Do you know you're saved? Does it show in your life that you're saved? And, and, and do you really want to have harmony in your family in the family of the church? And how faithful are you? Honestly now. You witness by your life, you, you're trying to live a clean, good, clean, pure life, but are you sharing the word? Are you confronting others lovingly, tenderly, seeking the Lord's will and how to do it? Father, in these closing moments, help us to examine our hearts and our lives. Draw us even closer to you. Help us to be your church, alive, active, becoming all that you would have us to be. We pray for mercy on our nation. We pray for a great spiritual renewal that will bring us back to you. But we know, Father, it begins in the human heart. It begins with those of us who know you. Really be in the church, whether it's on Sunday or the rest of the week. And now as we sing a hymn of invitation and commitment, help us to make some new and meaningful decisions about being your servants being obedient.